This is an extremely important disclaimer here. Okay, this is my first video we've released our overall rankings for. And the reason for this is whenever we're evaluating a running back versus a receiver, your league format is going to matter so damn much. Understanding your starting lineup requirements, understanding the size of your league, and also how many bench spots you are going to have really should dictate how you decide to construct your roster through the early rounds in your fantasy football draft. So the ranking that I'm going to be making right now are for leagues that start one quarterback, two running backs, two receivers, a tight end, and two flex spots. Now, if you play in a league where you don't start two flex spots and instead you only have one, in that kind of format, you are going to end up pushing up the elite level tight ends like Travis Kelsey and Mark Andrews because the wide receiver depth that's going to be required for you to actually create that dominant roster isn't necessarily going to be there. And to go along with this, we are actually going to be pushing up running backs and having an elite level quarterback as well. That's when you begin to take away flex spots. However, when you begin to add flex spots into your starting lineup, then it's going to be the exact opposite. Every additional flex spot that you add in a PPR format is most likely based on the opportunity cost of uh, different positions in fantasy drafts going to be optimally a wide receiver. So the more flex spots that you add, if you can get up to starting, say, five, six, seven receivers, you're going to prioritize those positions earlier and earlier in fantasy drafts, and you're going to inherently devalue running back, more importantly, tight end, because you're never flexing those guys, and quarterback as well, because their scoring is going to make up a smaller percentage of your starting lineup output as well as leading to a smaller impact with your actual win rate. So please understand that you may need to adjust these rankings ever so slightly to adjust for your actual league. But this is going to be one quarterback, two running backs, two receivers, one tight end, two flex spots, and a 12-team PPR format. Now, before we get into it, go down there, drop a like on this video, subscribe to the channel if you play fantasy football. Hopefully I did a decent, at least an adequate job explaining how you need to just move these rankings to fit your first format. But let's dive into our tier one here. Let's go into our first player. Jonathan Taylor. There's not much to discuss here with Jonathan Taylor. This is a running back that was dominant this past season. He was a running back two on a points per game basis, only behind Derrick Henry. And Derrick Henry only had that mark through, I believe, the first six weeks off the top of my head. So we can't even say for sure if Derrick Henry would have maintained his level of production that he displayed at the beginning of the season as Taylor was able to maintain his production throughout the entire year. And the reason we're going to have to put Taylor here at one, even though in a PPR format, he's not going to have access to the same ceiling that you may find from a Christian McCaffrey is simply because we should not be too concerned with any injury history at all with Jonathan Taylor. We go ahead, not only look at what he did his rookie season, but at the same time, look at what he did in college. Let's ignore his NFL career. Let's ignore his breakout year two. Let's ignore his rookie year for now. Let's go to what he did at Wisconsin and why he was such a dominant prospect coming out. The man put up 2,000, let me repeat myself, 2,000 total yards his true freshman season at 18 years old at Wisconsin. He put up 2,000 yards his sophomore year. He put up 2,000 yards his junior season. And he's improved as a pass catcher along the way. We go back to his 18-year-old season in Wisconsin. I mean, this is a player that only had 95 receiving yards, continuously improving on this mark to where this past season, he actually averaged three targets per game. Jonathan Taylor is giving you something as a pass catcher. And if, for whatever reason, say we were to see a Naheem Hines injury, with the lack of depth in this Indianapolis Colts backfield, all of a sudden, you may see Jonathan Taylor, say, go from three, three and a half targets per game to being in an offense where he's being asked to catch the ball four to five times per game, which could truly lift the overall ceiling that you have for Taylor and fantasy, of course, it would probably take a Naheem Hines injury, but even with that healthy Naheem Hines last year, Jonathan Taylor out there over a touchdown, a game, 127 total yards a game should be a good offensive line. And I know a lot of people are excited about the quarterback upgrade with Matt Ryan. I think if you look at the past two years with the efficiency for Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan, look at 
the fact that Carson Wentz was traded for a round three pick this offseason, Matt Ryan was traded for a round three pick this offseason, the contracts were comparable. I don't think it's a massive difference between these two quarterbacks. I think it's a slight upgrade moving over to Matt Ryan, but it doesn't matter. Taylor's young, ascending, and already at this number one spot. Now, number two, in the same tier, we are going to have Christian McCaffrey. With Christian McCaffrey, I understand you are rolling a dice whenever you decide to take him. I recently took him in our $500 fantasy football draft. In our $1,000 draft, I did pull the one one We ended up getting Jonathan Taylor. But in that $500 draft, my explanation for drafting Christian McCaffrey at pick four was simply that you're looking at a running back that has access to a ceiling that nobody else can come close to. I mean, we look at his 2019 season where Christian McCaffrey averaged almost a 25% team target share, averages almost 150 total yards a game. And he puts up a better fantasy year than what we've seen pretty much since either LT in at the time San Diego or Marshall Falk I, I mean or Priest Holmes like you have historical comps to Christian McCaffrey that are ridiculous and with Christian McCaffrey I would argue that he's probably in a better offensive environment in this season than he found himself in 2019 now I understand it's probably crazy to say but if we remember back who he was playing with that quarterback in 2019, it was some of the worst quarterback play that you had in the entire NFL. And the reason I like Baker Mayfield for Christian McCaffrey is A, we can go ahead, we can look at the targets that Chubb and Kareem Hunt have had in Cleveland over the past few seasons. Look at the target share that's just going to the running back position to begin with. Running backs that aren't nearly as good of pass catchers as Christian McCaffrey. And it makes sense because Baker Mayfield is going to be that pocket passing stationary quarterback where he doesn't have the mobility to be able to scramble and pick up first downs in his own right. Like we see Taysom Hill coming in and destroying Alvin Kamara's passing down roll whenever Taysom Hill does start. See the same thing with Lamar in Baltimore. See a smaller instance of that in Philadelphia with Jalen Hurts. But Christian McCaffrey has an elite level ceiling. Yes, he has the injury concerns. That's why we're going to have them behind Jonathan Taylor in these rankings. But if you pass on CMC and he stays healthy, you're probably losing your draft. That's how it is. Christian McCaffrey has a win rate at... 33% or close to it if he stays healthy. But now let's drop down to our next tier. And I will say, if you are drafting on underdog fantasy, for example, this is going to be the perfect example. On underdog fantasy, where y'all see us draft every single night, where I personally think you should be firing up some drafts and getting practice for your 2022 fantasy football draft, their wide receiver is going to be pushed up across the board. You have to start three wide receivers, and with it being best ball, inherently the wide receiver position is going to be a little bit more valuable. So if you see us on a live stream drafting on underdog, you may hear me say that there's a clear tier of five players at the very top. In your regular redraft format, I think that these wide receivers are a tier below the running backs. I don't think you can make an argument for them. But go make sure you start drafting on Underdog Fantasy to prepare for this upcoming season. I've done over 400 drafts on Underdog Fantasy. I think they're the most fun thing you can really ever do. And when you go and draft on Underdog Fantasy and sign up with promo code FLOCK, they will match your first deposit dollar for dollar up to 100 and you will get our 2022 fantasy football draft guide that has almost 300 pages of quality information, all our 2022 rankings with just a $10 deposit on Underdog Fantasy, where you can have some fun in drafts as well. You can find the link in the description, promo code FLOCK. But let's go down to tier two. Let's look at Cooper Cup. And with Cooper Cup, I think that he's an easy choice at three. I wanted to try to talk myself into being cute, having Justin Jefferson ranked ahead of Cooper Cup this season. Because if you go ahead, you look at Justin Jefferson, who of course is going to be our next guy. I mean, his rookie year and his second year put him on such a solid projection going forward, especially if we consider the fact that Minnesota is most likely going to look to throw the ball more this upcoming season with Kevin O'Connell. But Cooper Cup had 145 receptions. 1,900 receiving yards in 16 receiving touchdowns last season. It is damn near impossible for you to look at Cooper Cup with his first season with Matthew Stafford, leading the NFL in receptions, leading the NFL in receiving yards, and leading the NFL in receiving touchdowns, and rank any other wide receiver over him. It's boring. Cup at three. Jefferson at four. Like I said, I do think he has probably a similar ceiling to what we had from Cooper Cup last year. I think Justin Jefferson can get there. And with Jefferson, 
really, you have no blemishes on this overall profile. He was elite with his target share year one, elite with his target share year two, and the yards per route run off the freaking charts. One of the most talented wide receivers in the NFL, one of the most talented receivers the NFL's ever seen through the first two years of his NFL career. And if we're going to be going ahead and looking at this possible change in offensive scheme, Every report that you read coming out of Minnesota is telling us that they're going to push the pace of play a little bit more than what they've done in the past. And also at the same time, look to be more pass happy. Kirk Cousins, while he maybe isn't necessarily a great, great, great NFL quarterback, he's a very efficient one. And he's a quarterback that's been able to produce top level wide receiver seasons almost every single year. Like we go ahead and look at receivers that were able to say post 85 receiving yards a game, five and a half receptions a game and nine yards per target in their rookie or second season. You had Odell doing it, Justin Jefferson doing it in two years, Josh Gordon and Alshon Jeffrey. Very few players are ever able to put up the rookie and sophomore years that we saw from someone like Jefferson. And then we are going to have Jamar Chase at five with Chase. He actually did not lead his team in target share on a per game basis. Last year, T. Higgins did have that higher target share and his touchdown rate looks unsustainable on paper where he had a 10% touchdown rate, only 46 air yards per game. So you did have some random big plays coming off slants from Jamar Chase that may not necessarily be sustainable coming into this upcoming season, but it's not going to matter if the Cincinnati Bengals decide to be a more aggressive offense overall with the improved offensive line, which that's what I'm expecting. I'm looking at the fact that this team was number one in the NFL in adjusted yards per pass attempt, despite Joe Burrow taking the most sacks in the NFL. I think since PFF currently has them projected to have a top 10 offensive line, they're going to push the pace of play compared to what we saw last year. More plays per game, more fantasy point opportunities. We're going to have Jamar Chase here at five in this tier. And now dropping it down, these running backs would be up with the receivers if you do not have two flex spots and instead you can only start up to three wide receivers. Now, if you play in a league where you only start two running backs, two receivers and a flex, I'm going to tell you, you need to fix your life. You need to get into a deeper format. It sounds like the most boring fantasy football league that I've ever heard. But if that's the league you're playing in, you can move these running backs up. We're going to talk about a league that has two flex spots. We're looking at Austin Eckler at pick six. Austin Eckler's a running back. I haven't drafted too much on underdog fantasy because I think the running backs you have available to you in round two are so damn appealing. But Eckler is someone that has clearly bullish signs, reasons to be very excited on. I mean, this is a running back that last year came out, accounted for over 51% of his team's carries, almost a 15% team target share in this type of offensive environment in Los Angeles. Hell yes, you have that workload. You have that role in the receiving game with Justin Herbert as your quarterback. You're a running back to get very excited about. Now, I've said it once. I'll say it again. I think you do have a red flag here with Austin Eckler. I think the red flag is going to be serious touchdown regression. If we look at over the past three years, Austin Eckler has what seems to be an outlier type season in 2021. 1.67 touchdowns per game. We compare this to the previous season at 0.33 touchdowns per game. Now, these are two extremes, right? You have Austin Eckler getting extremely unlucky, scoring no touchdowns at all. And you have Austin Eckler getting very lucky and probably scoring an unsustainable amount of touchdowns with 20 this past season. I think we probably have something in between the two. I think Eckler probably gets closer to about one touchdown per game. And that does scare me ever so slightly with Eckler, especially if we consider the fact that Isaiah Spiller should be the best running back too that the Los Angeles Chargers have had since Melvin Gordon. And in 2020 and in 2019, Eckler didn't crack 40 percent of his team's carries per game i think they want to use him in a committee now he's going to get the high value touches what we always talk about the targets out of the backfield as well as the touches in the red zone so we're going to have him here at six but i think a lot of these running backs in this tier they have reasons to be excited and at the same time they have some serious red flags like our next running back here coming in at seven Najee harris I I can't be too excited about drafting Najee Harris. I mean, odd underdog fantasy is going later than this, and I really haven't drafted him too often. But this is a running back that I believe is going to have a very high floor. He finishes the running back nine last season, and we know that running backs usually take that elite jump up from year one to year two. Jonathan Taylor went from being the running back 10 in fantasy his rookie season to the running back two his second year. DeAndre Swift, the running back 17, to the running back 10. And Najee Harris 
has no added competition to his backfield. He should probably lead the NFL, assuming that CMC has a slightly different role in his overall snap rate in Pittsburgh. But the red flags are no top end speed, limiting big play potential combined with bad offensive line play combined with bad quarterback play, putting Najee Harris in a difficult position overall to have touchdown upside and at the same time, big play potential. However, he was able to overcome this last year with raw volume. He only scored 0.6 touchdowns per game. That's not great, especially with the volume that he had. If anything, I think that number actually comes a little bit higher and he had no big plays his rookie season. I think maybe he has one or two this year. Not going to be very often. He's not going to be prime Derrick Henry. Just a running back that does have reasons to be excited, but red flags as well. Now our next running back, in this tier is going to be our guy, Joe Mixon coming in at eight. Now, if you're following these rankings, you are going to be drafting Joe Mixon a ton. And don't be surprised if you see me draft Derrick Henry, if you see me draft Dalvin Cook ahead of Joe Mixon on a live stream. The reason is, is hell, I'm going to do over 500 drafts on underdog fantasy this off season. And you get Joe Mixon in the second round on underdog in almost every single draft. So if I want to have a balanced portfolio, even if I say want to have 15% Joe Mixon in all my leagues, I can still get that and draft Derrick Henry, draft Dalvin Cook over him when I get the chance. But that's just because I'm a psycho. I'm going to be in 500, 600 fantasy football drafts on underdog fantasy this offseason. But if we're looking at Mixon going from one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL, led the NFL in sacks allowed to now a top 10 unit, according to PFF, we've already talked about the potential for them to push the pace of play. You're looking at Mixon as a running back with 73% of his team's carries per game over the past three years and a target share close to 10%. Even if he does come off the field on some third downs, it doesn't really matter because he is still able to be involved somewhat as a pass catcher on first and second down where he has a higher receiving ceiling than what we've seen from say someone like Derrick Henry over the past three years. Like Derrick Henry is our next guy. Derrick Henry, his highest target share over the past three seasons has been 7.94%. Derrick Henry is not going to be the same quality of a pass catcher. Now, of course, if you're talking in non-PPR format, you can move Derrick Henry up from here. But Derrick Henry is going to be 28 years old. If we look historically, running backs in the past five years to have more than 250 rushing attempts at 28 years old or more, Adrian Peterson, Frank Gore, LaShawn McCoy. The highest finish out of those three guys, keep in mind, those are the only running backs 28 years old or un- older to have 250 plus carries over the past five years. You had Peterson as the running back 29 that season. Frank Gore is the running back 28. LaShawn McCoy is the running back nine. He would be an extreme outlier if Derrick Henry was able to come out and if Derrick Henry was able to repeat what he has done over the past three years. Not only does he have his age working against him, but this should be the worst offensive line play we've had in Tennessee pretty much since Derrick Henry's broken out. Right now, PFF has Tennessee with the sixth worst offensive line in the NFL. I I know if you've bet against Derrick Henry over the past few years, you've looked like an idiot. I was taking Devontae Adams over him last year. I was going to lose a lot of money last year before Derrick Henry got injured. I'm probably not going to draft much Derrick Henry this season. We're going to have him at nine, which honestly, if you go and look at underdog fantasy where the smartest drafters are drafting, It's not too far off where other people have him. He's going as the eighth pick off the board there. But now let's go down to our 10th player in the same tier, Dalvin Cook. With Dalvin, I'm concerned with the coaching staff change here. I think that all of a sudden he's going to be playing in an offense that does not run the ball nearly as much as they used to. With Dalvin Cook, he's missed close to, on average, five games per season throughout his entire NFL career. With Dalvin Cook, this is a running back that you also need to be somewhat concerned with his age. He was drafted in 2017. He's going into year three of his second contract. So with the coaching change, with honestly, this also being one of the worst offensive lines that the Minnesota Vikings have had over the past three years with the injury concerns, with the aging running back, I understand he does have a very high ceiling. He's a few years older than Christian McCaffrey. He doesn't have the same type of ceiling that CMC does. So Dalvin, we're going to put him in here. If you wanted to rank those running backs in whatever order, you can do it. That's why we have him in that tier. If you think Dalvin Cook should be ahead of everybody else, my man, that's your personal preference. My preference is going to be having him at 10. That's why I'm doing these videos in tiers and not just rankings. 
Now, let's go to pick 11, Stefan Diggs. With Stefan Diggs, oh, I, I love Diggs, depending on the format that you're in. If you're looking at a format that's going to prioritize you to grab your wide receivers early, I would definitely push Stefan Diggs ahead of some of those running backs ahead of him because with Diggs, he has no red flags whatsoever. He's playing in a one of, if not the most productive offenses in the NFL. A ton of volume available in that offense. We saw Stefan Diggs be the wide receiver three on a points per game basis just two years ago with a 27.5% team target share. If we get that volume back, plus the expected amount of touchdowns you may see in Buffalo, just given the fact that they have Josh Allen, they have one of the league's best offenses. Stevon Diggs has the potential to be the wide receiver one in fantasy this year. He, he truly does. If you're drafting with me on underdog, which y'all know we do that every single night in the live stream, I'm going to be drafting him a little bit higher than this, but that's because you are going to have the incentive to go wide receiver early in that kind of format. In your casual fantasy football league, I would still take him at 11. And then this same tier, we are going to have Travis Kelsey at 12. With Kelsey, what is very concerning is he's going to be 33 this year. Travis Kelsey is going to be 33. The next oldest player going in fantasy football drafts that is not a quarterback is Marvin Jones Jr. Going in the double-digit rounds. There's not another player going inside the top 100 picks that is as old as Travis Kelsey. I don't even think Marvin Jones Jr. is as old as him. So that is 100% a concern. It's a concern that Kelsey took a small step back with his efficiency this past season, but with the volume that you should have in one of the league's most efficient passing offenses with Patrick Mahomes, with Tyreek Hill leaving, you have to be very excited about Kelsey. I actually really like the addition of Sky Moore, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, given the speed that they should have on the outside, creating space underneath for Kelsey to continue to rack up those yards after the catch. So I'll have Kelsey at 12. There are definitely red flags all over him. But at the same time, we saw him two years ago just completely break fantasy football. Now, of course, thank you so much for being a part of the Flock Sport on the channel. Let me know in the comment section if you would like to see my top 24 rankings of four fantasy football drafts this upcoming year. But I think that should be it. I appreciate all of you. I really hope you have a great day. And if you want to have some fun drafting, if you want to draft with me on the live stream, make sure you go to link in the description, set up your underdog fantasy account, get ready. Use promo code FLOCK and you'll get our draft guide. You'll get all of our rankings. Yeah, that's all I got for you. Hope you have a great day and hope we get to see you with the live stream tonight.